So I promised you two videos today. So here goes a video on dysentery. I know it sort of seems like as if I'm doing the same topic that I just previously did, but trust me, it's not. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series of my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at dysentery. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon, I'm on our road to 20,000 subscribers. Do not forget to tell a friend to tell a friend. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. So remember when you talk about dysentery, it's just simply passage of bloody diarrhea or mucus or sometimes both in the stool. There are two main types of dysentery, bacillary dysentery, which is caused by bacteria, and amoebic dysentery, which is caused by parasitic infections. Bacillary dysentery, largely also going to be caused by a group of Shigella organisms, which we call Shigellosis. There are four etiological species, the Shigella dysentriae, Shigella flexionary, Shigella boidi, and Shigella sonei. Remember that the Shigella species are largely gram-negative facultative anaerobic organisms. They are going to be non-spore-forming, non -spore non-motile, rod-shaped bacteria. They're very closely related to Escherichia coli. And they become actually much more evident in the warm season because they are going to be coming from contaminated water as even contaminated food. Shigella can actually survive, survive in milk for up to 30 days and the flies can also excrete shigella. A small inoculum is actually quite needed, unlike cholera, which needs a very large inoculum. In terms of shigella, you need only just about 10 to about 100 bacteria, and these are adequate enough to cause you disease. Most patients are going to be asymptomatic carriers of the organism, and they can actually be a source of infection. Person-to-person -person transmission can even occur, even with um, poor hand-washing techniques. Remember that Shigella is going to be an invasive species, so it's going to be causing invasion and affecting the colon. So it's going to be causing some inflammation in the colon, the colitis. It's going to be causing mucosal edema. It can cause ulceration and ultimately bleeding. So the deeper the the deeper layer of the colonic wall, such as the muscularis mucosa and even the submucosa, could sometimes be affected in the inflammatory process. In terms of Shigella dysentriae, it also produces an exotoxin, which is known as sugar toxin, that may also cause watery diarrhea. And all four types of all four types of the Shigella are going to be causing a similar clinical picture, though their severity are going to vary. They generally have a short incubation period of about 12 hours to two days, and the clinical presentation usually starts off as patients having this loose stool abdominal pains, the fevers, the nausea, the vomiting. And as soon as the fever actually becomes quite high, this may actually lead to severe abdominal pains. You may have this tenesmus with blood in the stool. Other features like malaise, fecal urgency can also be seen. When you do ab abdominal examination, you may see abdominal distension as an even tenderness. And then there are going to be features of fluid and electrolyte loss. So these patients may have some features of dehydration. In some children, uh, neurologic manifestations like convulsions, headaches, and even lethargy may sometimes occur. In terms of diagnosis, you want to get your stool microscopy culture sensitivity, where you're going to see numerous leukocytes. You're going to see, of course, culture these things in the stool. A full blood count may reveal leukocytosis, or a leukoid reaction can actually be seen in children. A blood culture is indicated in those that are sick and those that are toxic-looking children. Management is largely going to be based on fluid and electrolyte balance. I think I covered a bit on this in the previous video, as well as the video on dehydration. I'll leave both tagged at the end of this particular video. Antibiotic therapy is actually recommended because it's going to be shortening the episode as well as improving the outcome and decreasing the carrier state. The antibiotics should be guided by sensitivity patterns and effective antibiotics used are things like oral ampicillin, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole and even nalidixic acid. In older children, you may also use quinolones. So in terms of nalidixic acid, 50 milligrams per kg orally in four divided doses for seven days, then ciprofloxacin, 15 milligrams per kg twice daily for three days. And remember that ciprofloxacin use is largely contraindicated in children, though the benefits here are going to greatly outweigh the risk. 
In terms of complications, you may have dehydration, electrolyte imbalance, sepsis, and bacteremia, which often is seen with uh, Shigella dysentriae, and organisms actually may even be isolated when you do a blood culture. They may have arthritis, conjunctivitis, encephalopathy, and even hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is often mediated by the sugar toxin. Remember that this is a condition that's going to be characterized by acute renal failure in the presence of what is known as microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. There is some vascular endothelial injury by the sugar toxin that's key to the pathogenesis of the condition. Remember that the toxin is going to be binding to these endothelial cells and is going to be causing endothelial cell injury. And most of this is going to be happening in the kidneys, so this is going to lead to this thrombi forming and this renal ischemia. Remember that antibiotics are not going to be indicated for hemolytic uremic syndrome. And the antibiotic treatment of actually some people that have um, the E. coli, which is hemorrhagic, which is causing a hemorrhagic type of colitis, may actually even increase the likelihood of developing hemolytic uremic syndrome. So often that's why we don't really like giving antibiotics in terms of diarrhea, because we want to prevent the onset of hemolytic uremic syndrome. You may, they may develop toxic myocolon, you may have persistent diarrhea and malnutrition, rectal prolapse, especially in malnourished children, and this is because of the tenismus that is there. They may have seizures which are due to the neurotoxins that are released with Shigella sonei. Prevention is largely going to be by drinking clean, boiled and chlorinated water, good sanitation as well as a good personal hygiene. In terms of amoebic dysentery, it's often caused by the parasite Entamoeba histolytica. So here they're going to have bloody diarrhea with mucus. They may have a low-grade fever. Dehydration is usually unusual. Diagnosis is made through stool microscopy and Sometimes some serodiagnosis can be made. Treatment is through fluid replacement. Like I said, I'll leave the video tagged at the end, as well as analgesia. And antibiotics like metronidazole, one to three years, you're going to want to give 200 milligrams orally three times a day for five days. Those that are three to seven, you give 200 milligrams orally four times a day for five days. And those that are seven to 10 years, you give 400 milligrams uh, orally three times a day for five days. Tenidazole could also be used as an alternative, 50 to 60 milligrams per kg orally for three days, and generally we avoid using any antidiarrheal agents. Generally in patients with bloody diarrhea, you often want to avoid using antidiarrheal agents. Complications include famine and colitis, colon perforations, you may have peritonitis, chronic infections, stricture formations, severe hemorrhage, amoebic liver abscess, and even an amoeboma. Prevention is going to be good disposal of excreta, like having good pit latrines, flushable toilets. We want to provide you, children and people with clean water. You boil the water. Remember that this is going to be killing the amoebic cysts in the water if you boil it for at least 10 minutes. So boil it until you can see the bubbles for 10 minutes. And of course, chlorinate the water. It's also quite effective, though the effects, effects are variable. So if you can boil and chlorinate the water, even better. Then personal hygiene, like washing your hands after using the toilet and even when preparing food or even before eating, are things that are going to help in preventing dysentery. I really hope you enjoyed this video on dysentery. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.